Welcome, dear students, to another lecture of parasitology. I'm going to discuss Leishmania and Trypanosoma today, and both of these are from Protozoa Group. What are our learning objectives for today's lecture? By the end of the session, you should be able to list various species of Leishmania and Trypanosoma, modes of transmission, life cycle, pathogenesis, clinical features, and laboratory diagnosis of Leishmania and Trypanosoma. In the end, I'm going to enlist few important hemoparasites, and I'll also let you know what are hemoflagellates. Let's get started with the classification first. So parasites are broadly classified into protozoa and metazoa. Protozoa are unicellular microorganisms and there is a group which is called as mystigophora or you can also call them as flagellata because they have got flagella. So Trichomonas vaginalis, Leishmania and Trypanosoma, all of these are included in this particular group. Leishmania is a genus and there are various species of Leishmania. Donovani, Tropica, Mexicana, and Brasiliensis. Vector is sandfly, and the mode of transmission is through bite of sandfly. The reservoirs can be animals and humans, and we have to take into consideration the geographical distribution first. So the Mediterranean, Middle East, Southern Russia and parts of China have dogs and foxes as reservoir. If you talk about sub-Saharan Africa, rats and small carnivores, they are the main reservoir. But if you talk about India, Kenya and Pakistan, humans are the only reservoir. Okay, now the question comes, what is a reservoir? So any uh, human animal, plant, etc., in which an infectious agent normally lives and multiplies. So it is called as a reservoir. The incubation period is three to six months. And what is the morphology? There are two main forms. The first form is called as a pro-mastigot form and the second one is known as an a-mastigot form. Now, the pro form has got flagella. And as you can see in case of a form, it is devoid of flagella. That is to say, there is no flagella at all. Life cycle of Leishmania donovani. And please remember the uh, life cycle of rest of the species are also the same, but the disease is a bit different. This Leishmania donovani produces visceral Leishmaniasis. We're going to talk about this in a short while, but let's have a look at the life cycle first. So the life cycle starts with the bite of sandfly. So the sandfly is going to take a blood meal. It would inject promasticote forms. Now, do you remember the promasticotes have got a flagella? So they are injected in skin of humans and in tissues, uh, the pro forms, they are converted into amastigotes. Now these amastigotes, um, they are taken up by macrophages, they multiply and fill till macrophages rupture. The infected cell is going to die and release progeny amastigotes um, and they can infect other macrophages and reticular endothelial cells of spleen, uh, liver, bone marrow, etc. So, this life cycle, which is now going to be inside sandfly, would start by first sucking of blood. And the sandfly is going to take up macrophages containing amastigotes. Now, these amastigotes would differentiate 
into promestic oats. And all of this is going to happen in the midgut of the fly. So they would keep on multiplying and they would migrate towards the pharyngeal area of the sand fly and then these promestic forms which are actually our end product they are injected again and this is how the cycle would be repeated. So there is a change of the promestic goat form to the amestic goat forms in humans and if you see in case of sand fly the amestic goat forms are again going to change into promestic goat forms. Clinical features of Leishmania donovani. It can cause visceral leishmaniasis as the name indicates the viscera is involved. The alternative names are Kalaza, black sickness fever or dum dum fever. There is a peculiar gray discoloration of skin of hands, feet, abdomen and face and that's why the name black sickness fever is given. And this dum dum is a town near Calcutta uh, in India and this is the other name for this visceral leishmaniasis disease. So the fever is um, initially continuous then it can be intermittent, uh, skin is dry, rough and there is hyperpigmentation. Now this hyperpigmentation is because of increased cortisol production which can in turn stimulate melanocytes and um, the most important feature or you can say the striking feature is the enlarged spleen. So the reduced bone marrow activity with cellular destruction in spleen results in anemia uh, that is decreased hemoglobin, leukopenia, decreased WBC count, thrombocytopenia, decreased platelet count and the splenic enlargement is because of proliferating macrophages and sequestered red blood cells. Now if the platelets uh, they count fall so the patient is prone to bleeding tendencies and uh, similarly as this leash mania can invade the immune system so there can be secondary infections like bacterial infections. And please remember the anemia type is of hemolytic just like in case of malarial parasites where we had discussed the anemia is hemolytic type nomochromic. Let me give you an overview of the lab diagnosis of visceral leishmaniasis um, first with the help of direct evidence and an indirect evidence. Now in case of direct evidence you can go for peripheral blood film, uh, the thick film especially and if you remember from malarial parasites lecture I had talked about the peripheral blood film. And in that lecture, I also discussed about the thick film. So you can make this thick peripheral blood film and you would find the AMS decode forms which are devoid of flagella. The other option is to go for blood culture and there is a name of this medium, triple N medium and you will find the pro mastigote forms which are going to have flagella. Then the biopsy material can either be obtained by lymph nodes puncture or you can perform a bone marrow biopsy with the help of uh, sternal or iliac crest puncture. Then there is a spleen puncture. So when the organ is considerably enlarged, it is one of the most valuable methods for establishing diagnosis. But the problem with this method is that the bleeding might continue from the puncture wound in the soft and enlarged spleen and this can result in death so it is not generally recommended. However, this uh, bone marrow biopsy is a safer procedure and the risk of hemorrhage is greatly minimized but it is more painful. And uh, one disadvantage of this um, bone marrow biopsy is that uh, parasites are scanty uh, when the, um, uh, the marrow is aspirated. So it may give you a negative result. 
In case of indirect evidence, you can go for blood counts, decreased WBC count is there, uh, decreased hemoglobin, raised erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which can also be in case of other uh, infections. Uh, uh, so you may find raised ESR. The serum tests include a very good test, which is the aldehyde test. Uh, and there are antimony and complement fixation tests. By the way, these are obsolete now, and there are few other antibody uh, detection tests like enzymalin immunosorbinase, immunofluorescent, indirect hemagglutination tests. Just before starting the direct and indirect evidence, we will first talk about a skin test, which is called as Leishmanian or Montenegro test. And in this test, a kill culture is injected into dermally. And these are basically the promestigotes. A positive reaction is an area of induration after 72 hours. And this is produced in cured Kalaza cases, uh, cases 6 to 8 weeks after recovery. And this actually represents a delayed um, uh, hypersensitivity reaction and this is accompanied by cell mediated immunity. Then is the Adler's test and in this test the development of pro forms of leash mania in Locky serum agar can be inhibited by a specific immune serum. Um, and the three species of Leishmania, like Leishmania, Donovani, Tropica, and uh, Brasiliensis, can be differentiated serologically to a certain extent with the help of this test. Direct evidence. So, as I mentioned earlier, you can take biopsy material, um, ideally from the uh, uh, spleen, but Again, there is a risk of bleeding, so bone marrow biopsy can be taken from either the sternum or iliac crest. And you can also perform um, peripheral blood smear examination of thick film and you will find the A masticotes or Leishman Donovan, uh, uh, and, uh, Donovan bodies, which are also called as LD bodies in stained film. Um, in case of blood culture, um, you can take the uh, 1 to 2 ml of uh, blood and um, it is diluted with citrated saline solution and these cells are then allowed to settle in a cool incubator overnight or probably they are centrifuged and the cellular deposit is then inoculated into water of con uh, condensation of the uh, this uh, novi macneil nichols or the triple n medium and at the end of each week a drop of condensation fluid is examined for pro masticote forms so the problem with this test is that it would give you A delayed result. I mean, it is least sensitive, it is slow, um, may take about one to four weeks. And if you see this um, this picture, so this is the AMST code. So this is nucleus and this raw chip structure is the kinetoplast. And in the blood culture, this is the promestigote form and this is the flagellum. Now let's talk about the indirect evidence. This involves blood count. So examination of leukocyte count reveals leukopenia and there is a decreased neutrophil count with a relative increase of lymphocytes and monocytes. So there are certain serological tests which are non-specific and some are specific. And the first one is the aldehyde test or formal gel test or Napier test. Now, this test is based upon an increase of serum gamma globulin. And why there is rise in this serum gamma globulin? Because the reticular endothelial system of the affected organs proliferate. 
and they become heavily parasitized uh, with an increase in the immunoglobulin G fraction of the serum gamma globulin. So there is basically hyper gamma globulinemia. However, this is not protective, but it is responsible for formal gel reaction. Now, this uh, rise of serum gamma globulin is actually applicable for both aldehyde test and the antimony test. So what are you going to do in this test is to take 2 ml of serum and around 2 drops of formalin, uh, which is 40%. Uh, so you're going to take this in the test tube. And a positive result is indicated by jellification of milk white opacity like the white of a hard boiled egg. The LDA test is not positive till the disease is of at least three months duration. So this is a problem with this uh, LDA test or formal gel test. Then is the antimony test. Uh, so this also depends on rise of serum gamma globulin. So a positive test is indicated by the formation of a profuse flocculent precipitate when a 4% of urea stibamine solution is um, uh, in distal water and it comes in contact with the either whole or diluted serum from a Kalazar patient. A negative result is indicated when the two fluids mix without precipitation. This antimony test is less reliable than the aldehyde test, so now it is not used. Um, so what is a flocculent? It resembles like wool, especially loose, fluffy organization. Then is the complement fixation test with WWK antigen. And basically, this is on the name of the discoverers. So the leishmania and mycobacteria, they share a common antigen. Now, the antigens of the human tubercle bacillus can be used to detect the immune bodies in the blood of Kalazar patients. The uh, advantage of this test is that uh, you can have this test positive within three weeks of infection. So this is helpful in early diagnosis of the disease. But again, this test is obsolete uh, nowadays. Then there are certain specific serological tests like indirect hemagglutination tests, immunofluorescent tests, enzyme link immunosorbinase test, and this is the same skin test. And don't worry about all of these uh, serological tests. We are going to discuss this in quite detail uh, when we will talk about the laboratory diagnosis of viruses. So in case of molecular diagnosis, you can go for PCR as well. So if I have to summarize the lab diagnosis of acute Kalaza fever, so you can uh, go for the first test, which is the blood count. And the total leuco uh, leukocyte count would be um, diminished. Uh, if the count is made every week, it will show a progressive decrease uh, in the counts. Then uh, there is test for rise of gamma globulin, the aldehyde test. Uh, however, it is negative and it is going to become positive only when the disease is at least of three months duration. Then you can also uh, demonstrate parasites in peripheral blood uh, film, especially a thick blood film, and by blood culture. Uh, and the material is obtained uh, by uh, a bone marrow biopsy from either the sternum or the iliac crest. The other species of Leishmania, like Leishmania tropica and Leishmania mexicana, can cause cutaneous Leishmaniasis, whereas the Leishmania brasiliensis can cause mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis. There are a few alternative names of uh, these diseases uh, like old world cutaneous leishmaniasis, uh, oriental so or delhi boil. So the um, this old world cutaneous leishmaniasis 
this disease is in Middle East, Africa, and India. And if you talk about the new world cutaneous leishmaniasis, uh, this is in Central and South America. The other name is Shikala ulcer, um, and uh, there is another name for this disease, uh, which is known as Beso. If we talk about the Leishmania brasiliensis, it is common in Brazil and Central America. The life cycle of these species is the same as that of the Leishmania uh, donovani. However, the rodent is the main reservoir in case of these species. Now, let's quickly go through the pathogenesis. The lesions are confined to skin in case of cutaneous leishmaniasis. But if you talk about the mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, the mucous membranes, cartilage, and skin, um, all of these uh, would be involved. And there is a granulomatous response, um, and there is a necrotic ulcer, and these lesions can be super infected by bacteria. So what are the clinical findings? In case of cutaneous leishmaniasis, initially you're going to find a red papule, which is a superficial lesion, uh, less than one centimeter in diameter. And um, finally, the um, satellite nodules are formed, which can finally ulcerate. Now these nodules are um, solid palpable lesions, which uh, are of larger size, uh, that is greater than one centimeter in diameter. So this is a nodule, this is an ulcer, this is a papule. Um, so the mucocutaneous leishmaniasis again would initially produce papule at the bite site, then there would be metastatic lesions, uh, usually at mucocutaneous junction of nose and mouth. Uh, with disfiguring granulomatous ulcerating lesions. So this can destroy nasal cartilage, but not the adjacent bone. Trypanosoma. The trypanosoma produces African sleeping sickness. The trypanosoma is a genus, Brucey is species, and it can cause African trypanosomiasis. So the Trypanosoma brucei has two subspecies, Trypanosoma brucei gambians and Trypanosoma brucei rhodesians. The vector is different this time. Now it's a setsi fly and the reservoirs can be zoonotic, which means the animals are involved in case of rhodesians and there are humans in case of gambians. And if you talk about the geographical distribution of this uh, disease, you will find that uh, this disease is common in Africa. The mode of transmission is through bite of setsi fly. Uh, blood transfusion is another mode of transmission, uh, though it is rare. In case of the Trypanosoma brucei, there are two morphological forms. The first one is the trypomastigote form and the second one is the epimastigote form. This is the nucleus, this is the kinetoplast. The flagellum arises uh, near it and emerges from the side of the body as an undulating membrane. Whereas in case of epimastigote form, this is again the nucleus, this is the kinetoplast, so it is close to the nucleus and this flagellum arises near it and emerges from the side of the body as an undulating membrane. The trypomastigotes have got two further forms, the metacyclic form, which is the much smaller uh, form, and then is the procyclic form. Now, when the set supply is going to bite, there would be metacyclic trypomastigote forms that would be injected into bloodstream and they transform into trypomastigote forms. And then they are carried to different tissues, body fluids, and they would stay as it is. I mean, there is no change of these trypomastigote forms to any other form.
The Setsi flag when takes a blood meal would now convert these trypomastigote forms into procyclic trypomastigotes, which would then be converted into epimastigotes, and all of this happens in the mid gut of the Setsi fly. Finally, we need this final product, which is the metacyclic trypomastigote form, which reaches towards the slavic gland of this Setsi fly and then is ready to bite again. And this is how the cycle is repeated. So, the Trypanosoma rhodiscyans would produce acute sleeping sickness, which means it is going to develop more quickly, starting from one month uh, roughly um, after bite. And in case of Gambians, it produces chronic sleeping sickness, which is going to begin um, uh, approximately months to a year after the first bite and this type of um, disease is known as either sleeping sickness or African trypanosomiasis. So what is the pathogenesis of African trypanosomiasis? Now please remember that there is antigenic variation. So parasites escape the initial host defense mechanisms and this is by extensive antigenic variation of the parasite surface glycoproteins. So there is cyclical fever spike due to antigenic variation. There is evasion of the humoral immune response uh, which contributes to parasite virulence. The second uh, um, reaction can be immune mediated. And this is against the antigens on the red blood cells, cardiac tissue, and brain tissue. And this may result in uh, hemolysis, pancarditis, or meningoencephalitis, respectively. So the, hemo um, the anemia is, again, of hemolytic type, just like in case of malarial parasites. So uh, in case of early stage, or you can say the stage one. This is also known as hemolymphatic stage. And there is trypanosoma chancre on the skin. So this is the trypanosoma chancre. So it would appear roughly about 5 to 15 days after the bite and it is usually going to resolve spontaneously. Then, uh, because there is heme, which means blood, and lymphatic, which means lymph nodes involvement, so uh, there would be generalized lymphadenopathy, right? Now, this generalized or regional lymphadenopathy, especially when the posterior cervical lymph nodes are involved, so this is called as winter bottom sign. So, this is a uh, this is a characteristic of trypanosoma brucei gambians especially. So I'm repeating, posterior cervical lymphadenopathy is known as winter bottom sign. And this is characteristic of trypanosoma brucei gambians infection. So there would be intermittent fever as well. And if you um, remember, the antigenic variation is especially responsible for this um, uh, cyclical fever. So there would be fever spikes uh, due to antigenic variation. Now, in case of stage 2, now this is the stage 2 late or CNS stage, or you can say there is persistent encephalitis in this stage. So there are behavioral changes initially, mood swings, um, daytime somnolence, followed by night time insomnia, headaches, um, probably loss of appetite, wasting syndrome, um, muscle tremors, slurred speech, apathy, uh, which uh, can ultimately end up into uh, coma. So uh, this is uh, actually the late stage. American trypanosomiasis or Chagas disease is caused by trypanosoma cruzi. Trypanosoma is a genus, cruzi is species. Okay, so 
vector is different this time. It's not a fly, it's a bug, which is called as a radiovid bug. So what is a vector? So a vector is any agent which carries and transmits an infectious pathogen into another living organism. And the alternative names of this radiovid bug are tritoma, cone nose or kissing bug. And the reservoirs are humans, animals, for example, domestic cats, dogs, armadillo, raccoons and rats. And mostly this Chagas disease is endemic throughout much of the rural Central America and South America. The bug thrives under the poor housing conditions, for instance, mud walls, thatch roofs of the rural areas. So the mode of transmission is uh, with the feces of an infected ready-wet bug. And blood transfusion, organ transplants, congenital, uh, these are the other modes of transmission, but this is the most important one. Now we will quickly go through the life cycle of Trypanosoma cruzi. The Trypanosoma cruzi has a vector which is the radiovid bug. Now this radiovid bug is going to bite, would take a blood meal and the humans would be infected either by the fecal matter of the bug being rubbed into the wound caused by the bite or by a possible contamination of the conjunctivae and other exposed mucous membranes uh, with the fingers. So these metacyclic trypomastigote forms would uh, penetrate through the um, um, various cells at the bite wound site and then they are going to change into amastigote forms. Now these amastigote forms would be taken up by the radiovid bug again would change into epimastigote. All of this is happening inside the uh, midgut of the bug. And finally, again, the metacyclic trypomastigote uh, form, which is the uh, last form. So it would reach the hindgut of this uh, bug. And then it is again ready to bite and the cycle would be repeated. Chagas disease has, as I mentioned before, um, an acute and chronic phase. And if it is untreated, infection is lifelong. Now, in case of acute phase of Chagas disease, you would find a nodule or chagoma near the bite site. So this is the chagoma near the bite site. And there may be unilateral facial edema, lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenum megaly. Now if unilateral palpebral swelling is there around the eye, this is called as Romana sign. In case of chronic indeterminate phase of Chagas disease, uh, which is followed by the acute phase, there is prolonged asymptomatic form uh, of this disease during which no or very few parasites are found in blood. So if we have to talk about the lab diagnosis of um, the American and the African trypanosomiasis, now in case of African trypanosomiasis, peripheral blood smear can be made uh, which is basically wet smear of unstained blood uh, or germs are stained um, um, for thick and thin smears. So you can find trypomastigotes. If you go for lymph node aspiration, uh, you can find rapid, uh, uh, I mean, you can actually observe rapidly moving trypanosomes. Uh, then you can go for CSFSA because uh, there is also involvement of brain in the late stage. So lumbar puncture is useful and can probably reveal some information or clue to the diagnosis of uh, this disease. I think you can also go for serological antibody detection tests like ELISA, complement fixation um, and uh, animal inoculation tests. 
Now, in case of Chagas disease, uh, again, you can go for peripheral blood smear examination, better thin and thick blood smear stain with GEMSA for, visualiz uh, for visualization of parasites. And um, you can also go for biopsy of bone marrow muscle um, uh, where you would find the amestic forms. Again, these serological tests can be performed. You can go for molecular tests like DNA, PCR, and inoculation into mice, which is the animal inoculation test, or you can also go for the Zeno diagnosis. Now, in case of the Zeno diagnosis, the lab-bred bug feeds on suspected Chagas disease patient. And then afterwards, the intestinal contents are examined for the presence of parasite. So the uh, in case of the um, uh, animal inoculation test, like for example, if mice and guinea pig are inoculated with patient's blood, in case of low trypanosomes, so there would be overwhelming parasitemia in case of these animals. So what are hemoparasites? So hemoparasites reside inside the bloodstream of the host. So we have plasmodium, which is on the top of the list. This is the ring stage of plasmodium. Um, then we have leash mania. I hope now you're aware with uh, the various morphological forms of leash mania uh, and trypanosoma. Uh, and then there is uh, another, um, uh, I would say there is another minor protozoan pathogen, which is called as Babesia. So this is also a hemoparasite, but it is a zoonotic disease, and this is um, mostly in the uh, United States. So the organism is endemic in rodents and is transmitted through the bite of tick. And the Babesia infects the red blood cells, just like uh, malarial parasite, and cause them to lice. Um, and in case of the blood film, we can find intra-erythrocytic ring-shaped parasites on the GEMSA stained blood smears. So these intra-erythrocytic ring-shaped trophozoites are often in tetrods in the form of a Maltese cross like this one. So um, some of the filarial uh, parasites are also included in this list. Uh, all... The takeaway message is leash mania produces various types of diseases like visceral cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. Similarly, trypanosoma, two species would produce either African or American trypanosomiasis or Chagas disease. The trypanosoma and leash mania have got flagella and that is why they are also known as hemoflagellates. So he means that they reside inside the blood. Thank you.